The Presidential Implementation and Advisory Committee for the Reform of the Ministry of Defense and Armed Forces of Nigeria assigned to tackle the present trend of insecurity in the country has called for the support of the House of Representatives to achieve the task before it. The panel seeks to inform lawmakers of what it has done so far and to solicit their support and wise counsel towards assisting the committee to successfully implement some of the key recommendations that would affect the structure, roles, functions and management of the armed forces of Nigeria and the Ministry of Defence. Well, joining us to discuss this is retired Air Vice Marshal Femi Badibo. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Thank you for having me. Um, so it, it's really interesting that the armed forces are finally asking for the help that they need because, um, you know, we always hear people say, well, the army needs more of this and that, but then it's great to hear that the army is asking for help. We see that the armed forces have been in the forefront of fighting terrorism um, in the country uh, over a decade now. And now that there's a, a different kind of monster that we're dealing with, which is banditry. Now, for someone who's worked, you know, uh, in, in, in the armed forces, you have served for several years. Why do you think that it's taking, it's taking so long for um, the welfare of the people who are in the forefront of fighting this uh, insecurity? Um, why do you think it's taking so long for the government to attend to the needs of these people? Well, I don't think it's uh, long. It's just the process in which the uh, assistance and the help is coming. That is a problem. Uh, if you notice, the Nigerian public um, continue to swing from being um, sympathetic to the military to uh, seeing the military as villains. It's a situation that is not the best for us. But uh, until we get to that stage when the Nigerians, as a people, understand that the military have uh, played a very important role in maintaining the peace and stability of this country and also securing um, everyone, we will not have the right um, attitude. If you notice, even from the National Assembly, those who are hard hit by the ongoing crisis particularly in the Northeast, are very sympathetic to the military and always calling for more support, more assistance, and so on. Whereas in some other areas, we see a different um, outlook and call. And that is because the military has been called too much into what are called domestic issues, issues that you normally be handled by the police. And so, you know, you, you get uh, an this negative situation. And I think uh, the, the military, because they feel that they should keep things under wraps, have not been playing the, uh, what would I call it, you know, the media very well. Because a lot that is going on, even the losses that the military is suffering, are being kept away from the Nigerian people. So every time that somebody close to some, some people uh, gets killed or something's come out, then you see sympathy from Nigeria, uh, the Nigerian public. The government has done some things. They have consistently done them, but there have been bottlenecks in the sense that you hear of a release today or an approval today, and it takes a very long time before some of these things uh, come up to the, to, 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 to the fore. When you are also buying military equipment, you see what happens. First of all, you have a very long period between when you place the order and when the equipment arrives. And so when those in the National Assembly understand this, I think they will move faster in doing this thing. You also have a situation where some countries, like we saw with the US government recently, give you a, an equipment like the um, Tucano aircraft, and then they are telling you what and what you cannot do with the aircraft. That seriously limits the capability of the armed forces. But, but, but is so, that not as a result of the fact that we have had issues of human, human rights abuses, especially with the, 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 the freshest of them all, which is that soldiers shot at people at the toll gates in 2020? I mean, should that not necessarily be one of the reasons why these people would be asking you not to use it for issues that would come up as human rights abuses? 
Well, if you're using aircrafts for um, bandits, terrorists, kidnappers in the northeast and the middle part of the country, I don't see where that comes into the issue of the toll gate. It's just that, you see, um, when you listen to the news, um, especially at CNN today, you see all kinds of human rights abuses going on in the United States of America. So the policeman of the world who is trying to tell everybody how to do things and how to do, um, also have a lot of skeletons in their cupboards. You have to be where it's happening. I'll tell you, for instance, that if the U.S. have right men have been known to persecute some of their men, officers and men, who committed atrocities in areas like in Vietnam and, and so on. But, you see, when you talk about capturing, uh, you know, like terrorists and keeping them, the law says that when you capture them, then you are going to have to feed them. You are going to have to take care of them. You are going to have to also um, take some of your soldiers who should be fighting to now guard and protect these people. Mm -hmm. What are the resources that you have? And then when you have been involved in acts of terrorism perpetrated by colleagues of these people, um, I'm not trying to speak for the soldiers who go out of the way to do some things, but the truth is that um, we're, we're all humans, and you must consider the conditions under which those who have been attacked are retaliating on those who are attacking them. Unfortunately, no, you know, human rights agencies are not there to see how our soldiers have been killed and have been, uh, you know, have been ambushed and so on. But rules are but rules. But somehow, the other things are going on. And so by the time they are arrested, everybody now is, wants you to treat this terrorist um, with kick gloves. We've just seen what has been happening all of a sudden again on the Katna Abuja Road. Um, it, today you say that, that you've got things under control. Tomorrow the same people show up. And they're even more violent. And, um, you know, there is something that we have to get to the bottom of. But one of the things I'll say is that going to the National Assembly to ask for assistance is something that we should have been doing before. Okay. Um, it, we used to have a situation where the government just decides and does buys arms and ammunition for the armed forces. We're getting to a situation now where the armed forces realize that sometimes they must be involved in the purchase of these things. Mm -hmm. And you know that in, you have a defense committee, you, you, have the, in the, in the, you have the Air Force and the Navy committees, both in the Senate and National Assembly. These people have their own interests. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the chief of army staff can decide that he wants to buy a particular type of weapon system from a particular country for reasons best known to him. Maybe that would be best. At the end of the day, we had situations in the past where from the presidency or somewhere, they just called the, the, the service chief and say, oh, yeah, you wanted to buy uh, a particular type of vehicle or weapon system. He said, yes. OK, guess what? Um, a president just came from some country on the visits. They also produced the same thing. And we've negotiated for you to get that. Now, this may be totally not in line. You see, especially when you come to aircrafts, maintenance, training of the technicians is a complex matter. The spare parts are not interchangeable. So a situation where you are buying six year, 10 year, everything is a recipe for disaster at the end of the day. You can say, oh yeah, we have a lot of aircrafts, but how many people are trained on the aircraft? How many technicians are trained on them? Where are you, how are you sourcing the aircraft from this? If instead of having six, I mean, 24 aircraft from six different countries, if you have all 24 from one country, you have a bus load of spare parts that can be used for anyone that is going on. You have technicians that are trained and that can be deployed in different parts of the country working on the same aircrafts. These are the things that we also need to educate our people in the National Assembly for them to understand mm -hmm. and to come along with the service chiefs in their making these purchases. Now, uh, I'd like to point to something that, um, a statement that was made by um, the um, chairman of the panel that went to visit the National Assembly, um, retired Army Major General Alwari Kazer. Uh, he said something that um, 
The way the Nigerian Armed Forces were organized, trained, equipped, and managed by the Defense Ministry was based on the need to confront conventional threats, something that you have um, you know, spoken of, and not emerging security challenges, hence the reform that the country's defense and security architecture has felt uh, has become imperative. Now, he also says, in his words, today, in effect, the Ministry of Defense and the Armed Forces of Nigeria needs to be properly organized, structured, manned, and required uh, with the required mix of military and civilian personnel, um, as this is the global best practice in almost all countries, especially developed countries. Uh, he kept on talking about the fact that the Ministry of Defense needs to be reformed, and the Armed Forces of Nigeria will also ensure that we have all the armed forces that are affordable for the national economy while sufficient in size, structure, training, equipment to respond effectively to both conventional and astrometric war. But the, 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 the key thing here is size. And size here is talking about the number of people we need to be able to win this war. And he also talked about what the economy can afford. So let's talk about that. It's very important. I remember sometime in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, soldiers were complaining. And this, this is something you hardly see, soldiers complaining about the fact that they do not have the kind of weapons sophisticated enough to fight the enemy that they were facing. And knowing that this is a guerrilla warfare of sorts, they need the same type of firepower, if not a higher power, uh, for, for them to be able to deal with that. We're also talking about the issue of welfare, where most times the, the monies that these people need does not necessarily get to them. We've also seen cases where people were killed in the line of battle and their families are ejected from these barracks. So these are issues that need to be addressed. And I think he encapsulated it in that message. But how do we deal with the size and the economy? The size and the economy are two issues that the National Assembly have to discuss and agree upon. You see, in an ideal situation, um, the National Defense Committee or the National Defense Policy is drawn up in such a way that it states the threats that the Nigerian armed forces are required to contend with. The Army, as a rule, are designed to engage with external aggression. And you're talking about maybe on two fronts. Now, by the time even when you're, to you're talking about being able to protect Nigeria and being able to go out of Nigeria to take care of issues like, uh, you know, peacekeeping operations and like we used to have in Liberia, in the Sudan and in, in Somalia and so on. By the time the Nigerian um, government decides that, no, we want you to be able to operate on three fronts, then it means that you must be able to do those two things plus maybe substantially assist the Nigerian police in managing internal aggression. Now, that committee should go back and sit down and work out the manpower, the scale of manpower that is required. It is when you work out the scale of manpower and equipment that you come back to the Nigerian government, so to say, to say, okay, right, this is it. Can you afford to pay or to, 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 to recruit and equip and arm this? Remember, at the end of the Nigerian Civil War, we had to... Um, you know, we had to delist a large number, well over a hundred soldiers. Some of them were sent to the police, some were sent to uh, customs and so on, because the army had grown so large to be able to fight that war. Subsequently, we have been operating on what would be a much bigger force. Now, if we're going to go higher, then definitely we're going to have, have to get more manpower. That means more in terms of equipment, salaries, and even barracks and so on. Those are issues that have not been clearly spelled out by the government. Then when you come, when you mention the issue of bar, uh, people being kicked out of the barracks, the, 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 the existing rule is that only uniformed personnel, serving personnel, stay in the barracks. And you have, um, let's say somebody retires or somebody dies, there is a, there's a stipulated amount of time that they stay in the bags and they move on. Well, unfortunately, we have lost uh, AVM, retired AVM, um, Femi Badibo. Uh, but that has been an interesting conversation. We're hoping that we can have more of that. But that's all we can give to you tonight on Plus Politics. I am Mary Anna Cohn. 
Thank you for watching.